So our objectives are to understand the science of fear, learn neuroplasticity research and its implications in our daily life, and transform the pain and the suffering into songs or wisdom. So the brain that changes itself, what does that really mean? Uh, researchers are discovering that we can teach an old brain new tricks. We, when we were in medical school, one of the learning was that if there's a damage such as a stroke or a brain, brain injury of some sort, you know, trauma, motor vehicle accident or something, that that part of the brain is dead and therefore you're out of luck. There's really not a whole lot that can be done in general. Uh, there's a new research which is indicating the power of the brain to return to its being and really adjust to the new way. So either we can stay in a stroke and just give up, or we can learn how to be unstroked and return. And that is a very powerful science. It's beginning to unfold, and really is a very hopeful science. Otherwise, we can remain victimized into the science of just being an accident of the life and we are done. And it seems the organ is more flexible than scientists originally thought. So what controls our health? So I'm just going to sprinkle some studies, but not heavy duty research, but yet indicating that these are not just anecdotal stories. Women who believed that they were prone to heart disease were nearly four times as likely to die compared to women with similar risk factors who did not hold such fatalistic views. So just the belief system. Oh my God, I have a breast cancer. It's going to, I'm just going to die from that. Or, oh my God, I found something that needs to be taken care of and I will get the best possible treatment and really make it a part of my life that I'll work on. You know, so there's a different way of seeing that, and I see that in my practice all the time. I have a woman, she had diagnosis of breast cancer on both sides. I have never seen somebody that with that kind of a attitude and connectedness with her church, with her community, with her family. She would come in after her chemotherapy, she would come in and say, look at, I don't have hairs anymore, but I can wear all different kind of wigs, and I love it. <laughs> Versus, oh my God, I don't have hairs, and I cannot go out in the community anymore, I cannot talk to people anymore. There's a very different way of seeing things. It just was her attitude, and I learned so much from her, because for every step she would say, I'm going to see my doctor today, and I'm so excited, because I want to learn what else I need to do so that I can be healthy versus, oh my God, my life always sucks. You know, there's a different way of seeing the same event in our life. The higher risk of death, in other words, had nothing to do with the usual heart disease, which is age, blood pressure, cholesterol, weight. Instead, it, it, it tracked slow, closely with the belief, think sick and you will be sick, right? You know, it is just, just that. And we have not often paid as much of attention to our thinking and belief processes as much as we look at the numbers from the cholesterol. Doctor, what are my numbers? Am I better than the last time? You know what? What are your own numbers? What are you thinking about what you got? That is the empowering. It's not the doctor who is going to give you the health or, or take it away from you. So am I going backwards? Yeah, I often do that. So the nocebo response, a placebo is when the patients feel better for reasons unrelated to the specific healing properties of the treatment, right? So if I give you a medicine and a non-medicine, people will come back and feel better with a non-medicine. You know, isn't that very interesting? So there's, what, why, why is that happening? And the researchers all, all know that. So they, they try to mitigate the effects of the placebo effect by blinding the studies and whatnot, which is a good thing to do, but still the placebo works. The nocebo makes patients feel worse or does other harm in the, in the same way. Common symptoms are drowsiness, headaches, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, and stomach upset. 
Many health professionals are not aware of nocebo effects, yet the reaction can cause patients to drop out of clinical trials, stop taking drugs they need, or end up using other drugs that complicate their treatment. So a clinical example would be, I can almost now tell when I'm prescribing a medicine which patient will come back and tell me oh, I'm having these side effects on the medicine. I can 95% of the time predict that. And here are the indicators. The indicators are, when I'm talking about a treatment, they will begin to say what side effects it would cause me. Okay. And, I, and I know for sure they're going to do Google research, and I know that they're going to look at that uh, pharmacist literature that will be provided, and they will always come back and list those side effects as they are listed, always. On the other hand, there are patients who will say, you know what, I just do not like this depression. It is taking away my life. I will do anything and everything to get better. They're the one who will come back and say, you know what, I'm feeling a little bit better at the time when they shouldn't even be feeling better. These medicines don't even start working for a couple of weeks anyways. They cause more side effects in the beginning part of the treatment before they start working. And that's the time they will come back because they have the belief that it's going to work for them and they trust the doctor. Okay? And if they don't, you will invariably always have the side effects, no matter what, how great that medicine is. And the side effects are literally from top to bottom as the pharmacist provides or as Google provides. This is just, just the way it is or your money back. So, so this is, but I'm kind of, it's not that it's right or wrong. I'm just identifying effect of our being and then I'll kind of make some sense out of that why this is important. Okay, um, so this is, these are very exciting times actually, very, very exciting times. Genes and disease. So often the question people would ask me is, you know, I as a mother, I have depression. Now my 15 year old daughter, is she going to have depression? Well, if we all had depressions and we all were going to get it anyway, we all will be very depressed. We all will be very diabetic. We all will be having Alzheimer's, by the way, right? There's a fundamental principle of protection built into our system, and this is very critical. We are not a victim of our genes. Genes are no different than if you go to a restaurant and you say, you know what, can I have the menu? They actually will, should give you anyways. And you look at the menu. You have the choices of maybe 10, 20, 30 foods to order, right? The environment is offering you the potential to order anything that your heart desires, right? So if you're hungry, very hungry, you'll order an appetizer and a soup and a salad and the bread. And then you'll order the main course as well, right? That you cannot eat, you'll pack it and take it home. <laughs> yeah, isn't that beautiful? You know, but the hunger perception is so much, but you have the choices to make between those options which are open for you. Similarly, the genes offer us many options. Our lifestyle gives us the option of which one we open up. Okay? So we can choose to have a lifestyle which will be promoting cancer or promoting health. We can have a lifestyle of promoting diabetes or promoting healthy living being. That's fundamentally our choice. So when patients ask me, I'm so sorry, I, my mom and everybody else was a diabetic, so I had no choice, you know what, get real. You know, that's, that's really not an option. You're becoming a victim. So when somebody has depression in their mother, it does not mean that everybody's going to have the depression. Plus, they can make choices which are fundamentally supporting to help them stay healthy. So exercise is a wonderful antidepressant, right? You don't have to be a member in a, in a record club to be able to get exercise. This whole earth is a record club. Go out and to walk. Who stops us from walking? You know, I saw a jogger out there on a day when it was raining. She was just jogging, and I see her jogging no matter what time of the year it is. When there's a fundamental desire to do something, there's a way to do that. When there's a fundamental desire to find a reason not to, we'll sit in front of a television and just flip channels. So the genes are not controlling. They're just the blueprints for a guidance 
just the way there's a blueprint to make a home, do you think after you get a blueprint, what do you do with the blueprint, you know? You are the one who then develops the architectural detail, you know, what goes where and how that's kind of set up. The blueprint is just a blueprint. It does not tell you, do not change that faucet. You cannot change this thing over here. You must, you are destined to have a room exactly like this. You know, you make your own little changes and you continue to evolve. I don't like this thing over here. This wallpaper is not the way I wanted it, right? So we can change the wallpapers of our life, ourselves, and be able to evolve into a healthy being. And that's the exciting piece of this conversation. So they allow us to have the blueprints. So the coding regions make up less than 5% of the genome. The function of the remaining DNA is not clear. And some chromosomes have a higher density of genes and, and, and so forth. Well, why do I go back all the time? Um, OK. So in human beings that you and I are, there are 46 chromosomes, 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes, and two sex chromosomes. Between them house almost 3 billion base pairs of DNA that contain about 30,000 to 40,000 protein coding genes. The coding regions make up less than 5% of the genome. The f well, why did I, why, what am I doing? OK, well, I'll just kind of get down to this. This is a slide from uh, NIH. And this is absolutely so exciting. This, these are very exciting times. It talks about the epigenetics. And, and, then, and really, and I'll kind of go back to make a connection here. For me to work in the state hospital system was probably a beautiful thing to happen. I would have never learned some of the initiatives that the state takes, such as peer mentors, peer specialist programs. Who would know somebody else better than somebody who had gone through that difficulty themselves? How could, how could a book describe a living individual? The books that we read in medical school or in therapists and whatever trainings we do are a collection of common knowledges to put together into what, how things happen commonly, right? This is what the books do. You know. If you have this uh, incidence of cancer, this kind, 40% of the people will get this, 50% of people will do this, 5% of that, 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 that's just the collective aggregate information. It does not describe the individual detail of an, every person, right? It just can't. It's just a collected, aggregated data. So when we have these programs such as peer mentors and peer specialists, for the very first time, I begin to realize the power, absolute power of another human being who has gone through difficulties in their own life and be able to mentor another individual. It was so powerful and so beautiful. You could see somebody unfold and say, I can relate to you when I was in jail. I can relate to you when I was in struggling in a hospital. I can relate to you how it is for, for me not to take medicine. I can relate to you when they labeled me as a schizophrenic. I can relate to you when I don't like those terms. I had a, he's a medical student. His father and I, you know, we are kind of friends. And he is struggling with some depression and whatnot. So he comes in. And I just saw him actually last uh, uh, Wednesday or Tuesday. And he's, I'm going to get a little vulgar, vulgar here. He goes, I don't like these fucking titles. I don't like these fucking titles. These bipolar disorder. All you people see me is this absolutely ridiculous titles. I don't like them. And I don't blame him. Who would like, who would like to be called here a diabetic? Hey, Mrs. Diabetes. <laughs> you know? We just have to change those perceptions. So my perception changed by hearing and feeling and the agonies and the pain and the tragedies. And then I began to recognize to be able to honor that. So, but that's, I also see that as a very empowering movement. It's a very empowering movement, which is empowering us with the knowledge of human beings who can be part of the treatment strategies. So in the same spirit, I want to kind of help you understand how Empowering it is me for as a scientist to see the role that we can play in our lifestyle. So cancer, control of gene expression by epigenetic modification could have a role in tumor formation and could explain how environmental factors trigger cancer. Some people are saying, actually, cancer is a lifestyle disease. The way you live, you can have a cancer. You know? So we have the ability to pre prevent it from happening, right? 
or otherwise we can just be a victim to another disease that is very scary. Per prenatal changes, you know, the molecular modification to fetal and maternal DNA before birth could later make people susceptible to type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So just, just yesterday or day before yesterday, I'm talking to a mother over the phone whose son is in the hospital at this time. And they had a very difficult relationship, and now she's coming together. And I said, Mom, to tell me about him. And she goes, well, I am a recovering alcoholic. So when he was young, I was drinking heavy. And then I asked her a question, were you drinking when you were pregnant with him? First she said no, but I can tell the difference between the no, which is very strong no, and the no, which is just a questionable no. So I asked her again. I said, well, were you drinking? She goes, a beer and two. And we always multiply a beer and two by 10 to 20 times, because alcoholics minimize their use. The people who are using Xanax and other, they, they maximize their use when we see them in our practices. So I can always multiply this and kind of take a different answer. So I knew she was drinking during her. I can almost tell that she was. And the Im impact of a drinking mother and the impact of a person who is stressed out is affecting the fetus. Then we all, as a culture and society, pay the price for somebody who has difficulties. That's, that's that, is, you know. The people who also have difficulties such as when they're growing up and they have trauma, the first six years of life are very difficult. If you have difficult experiences, this is your subconscious that's always going to be with you, and you're living those stories over and over again. So you're not acting out from the present day life, you're living what has happened, you know. And for this individual, without kind of breaking his anonymity, I would say, he's, we start talking about, and he said, at four years, I was taken to a shelter and taken away from my mother. And he goes, that's where I, heard, where, where I heard how to swear. That's where I learned how to begin to swear, at age four. Okay? We as a culture are now paying the impact of that happening at a very early age. And my, my, my passion these days is to do a lot more preventive care so that we don't have to do secondary and tertiary care. And we are empowered with that knowledge. So with that kind of thing, uh, brain disorders, epigenetic changes have been implicated in brain health from cognitive decline in normal aging to conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and autism. The incidence of autism, autism have increased many folds. And the people who are in scientific world kind of doing all these you know, researches, they're beginning to say it's the environment and factors that we are living in. It's impacting the rising incidence of the autism. Okay, that's number one. I talked to a, a, one of my colleagues is an ophthalmologist, and she goes, I'm seeing a lot more cataract at a very younger age. And I said, why? She goes, I don't know. It just is happening. So the science is always trying to catch up with the, the rising and the declining incidences of different conditions. But my point is, I think our environment that we live in pay, plays a huge role. Our lifestyle plays a huge role. But by the time we prove a point, it's from five or 10 years, because the research has to take that long to make a point proven in the scientific world. But I think we, we can begin to see the early signs of what's happening and begin to take some. Take some um, so chronic diseases such as lupus erythematosus, asthma, insulin resistance, obesity, and diabetes, they all are. I mean, there are a lot of them are environmentally uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know. So this is, I, I always pick up a slide or two to make me look like a doctor. <laughs> because sometimes people come in and say, you know, do you do any medicine therapies too, you know? I mean, are you a real doctor anymore? So I just try to just impress myself and remind everyone that, yes, I do. So this is just a slide to make you, imp to impress upon you. Well, but on, on a realistic note, that it's a very complex world of genes and how it gets expressed. I just want to show you, without kind of overwhelming you, that a lot happens there. How the genes and the messages between the proteins and the RNA, then the messenger RNA is going on. Um, I should learn better. So the genetic versus environment. The cardiovascular diseases are the most common diseases of death. And Many a times, we create our own cardiovascular diseases, and then we go for a plumbing job. 
Now, there are some diseases that we really cannot get out of. Okay, so hemophilia as an example, you know, Huntington's chorea. You and I really cannot get out of those diseases because they're so autosomal dominant conditions. Okay, so there are, and there, there are kind of some are autosomal dominant, some are you know recessive and whatnot. But the point is, there's some genetic factors which play a very strong role, but they are a small number. They're not. I mean, they're like five percent, ten percent kind of thing, kind of thing. You know, a large number of conditions that we live in really are not uh, uh, based on based on the diseases uh, uh, from from genes. So the environment and us. So our genes express based on the environmental exposure. And, and some of the researchers are saying, you know, that there's, there are two percent of the things which are genetically, you know, coded that you really cannot get out of. And others are lifestyle and environment and the exposures. So just look at this beautiful pictures of our, our, our being. And so this is red blood cells. You know, aren't they looking so beautiful? You know, they're absolutely remarkable. This is a cancer cell in the lung. Okay, so these are the healthy ones. This is not a very happy looking one. What, you know what this is? Anybody who can guess that, I'll give them something nice. I don't know what. <laughs> this, is, this is an ovum. This is a human ovum. And these are the Purkinje cells in our brain. But look at how beautiful these things are, how colorful they are, right? You know, they're absolutely remarkably beautiful. So is our environment, you know? So we're living in a time that we can appreciate the external if we have the time to do that, but we also have to appreciate how these affect us. So the wars and the fears, they play an absolutely severe role in our psyche. And these are just pictures, random ones, you know? So fears, whether it's in the eyes of somebody who is very close to us, somebody who's distant from us, but the fear is fear. It really doesn't matter where, where it belongs. So the fear at the brain level, the British researchers had earlier linked increased amygdala activity to decrease trustworthiness. Because the increased amygdala activation has been associated with social fear and social phobia, genetic risk for anxiety and depression, and possibly with social fear and autism associated with uh, assessed during uh, phases uh, uh, processing. This dual mode of action of oxytocin in humans suggests a potentially powerful treatment approaches towards socially relevant fear. Uh, so I, I'll just kind of go over that in, in a little bit. So there are fear hormones. We actually make fear hormones, you know. And those are based on, if, if at this point in time, we just had a very loud thunder. We all will begin to make these compounds without our even knowledge. We are hardwired to do those things. And then our response to those is by various mechanisms, which includes um, uh, you know, the glucocorticoids, steroids, you know, the adrenal cortex and catecholamines, and we have the adrenal medulla in our, in our brain, which kind of, uh, sorry, adrenal medulla is in the, on the top of the kidneys, and the sympathetic nerves. So all of these guys begin to plan and instantaneously take us to a safe zone. So fears, people develop specific fears as a result of learning. This has been studied in psychology. And we'll just kind of give an example of fear conditioning, beginning with John Watson's experiments and whatnot. In his study, an 11-month-old baby was conditioned to fear a white rat in the lab. The fear became generalized to include other white furry objects. In the real world, fear can be acquired by frightening traumatic ex accidents. So if, if something looks like what it was at an early age, then you have generalized that to many, many other things in your life. So many of our clients and our patients and we ourselves live in those fears which are dominated by our own inner previous experiences because that drives us to try to be safe. And, and, and this is a very powerful. I mean, has anybody had an accident in their life? Okay, do you still remember it? Okay, do you have to pick up a book and say, well, let me recall what happened that day when I was driving in a car. It's so vivid in your memory that you can never forget that, right? So that's the power of the past experiences, but the power of past experiences also can be paralyzing if they overwhelm us with a fear emotion. So it's fear and its impact, you know, I, have an office I had an office manager, she was fearful of some of these kind of bugs. 
and things. But this whole system begins to act up very effectively to save us from something that we think is not safe for us. So we use our hormones. This is one slide I want to kind of also talk about, which is also uh, the impact of uh, uh, different uh, you know, factors. So the scientists do research in petri dishes. So what we do is, you know, we have cells. We put the cells in some, some medium, and then we see what happens with them. So the stem cells are, have the potential to develop into different types of cells. So when we are sperm and, and uh, ovum, they come together to make one cell. That cell has the potential to become many different kinds of cell, our liver, our eyes, our nose, our brains, our, our intestine, and everything. So in, uh, in other words, in that one cell lies all the information, but then it finds itself into places where it can begin to become bones. It can begin to become muscles. It can begin to become different things, but it has the ability to differentiate we don't fully understand how these things happen, but we know that this does happen. So things can become bone marrow, it can become uh, you know, something, nerve cells and heart muscles and whatnot. So the basic point I'm trying to make in this conversation is the shift in the environment in the outside of that cell can lead it to become one or it can lead it to become something different. Okay? So scientists, that's why they use these cells and say, well, if we have different diseases, let's try to fix them in Parkinsonism or something else. We'll use these cells and try to use them so that we can fix what's not damaged in a person's body and whatnot, and that's where you know, a lot of research is happening. But I just want to make a point that there is a way to shift by changing the environment of a cell. So we can also shift our external environment and be able to change our internal environment, right? So this is just a dance. The human body relies on bugs for health, and we have 50 trillion cells of our body. Without the microbes that we have, the human body you know, that we need to have, there will be no human life. So this little thingy is, is found in our yogurt. It's a healthy bug to have, right? So bugs are not always bad. They're good bugs, too. And, and we can enjoy its presence to keep our, our, our intestine healthy. If we're eating too much of junk food, this little guy dies away. Okay? It just cannot maintain its presence because it's almost like if you have a bad neighborhood, you don't want to have people living there. So the bugs don't want to live. Good bugs don't want to live in our body if we have a bad neighborhood. So when you're going through next time, through McDonald, remind yourself that this is not a healthy meal that you're having. Whatever you feed your body, it becomes, right? You know? So if you want to have a healthy bugs in your, in your system, you might as well be eat, eating at least three-fourths of your meals should be vegetables and fruits and, 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 and healthy organic meals because you will have healthy bugs living in your system, which will keep you from going to a doctor and paying, paying your visits there. So the toxic environment can be, and we see that all the time, toxic while we are pregnant, using drugs, just creating all these smokes and things that we are having, our, and then even raising our children in a toxic environment by our, our, our own behaviors. I'm going to kind of uh, uh, have a couple. So our journey from somebody here and somebody here has gotten to be here, and trust me, you will be paying visits to doctors if you keep on going to these kind of places because there's no getting out of that. Okay? I don't have any stocks in another, another company either, but I, all I can say is, you know, mind what you're eating and how you're eating those things. Um, so on that note, uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just kind of uh, make maybe quick points. There are various studies by different folks. You know, this is another NIMH study uh, about you know, how the oxytocin plays a key role in complex emotional and social behavior, such as attachment, social recognition, and aggression, and so forth. And you know, so these people did uh, some studies about how the brain works, and you know, if you I mean, good, good scene, then bad scene, you know, a good hormone is kind of making our brain happy, and, and oxytocin is a great, great place to be at, and so forth. So you can, uh, you know, I mean, I just want to kind of uh, go to a different presentation in the moment, but all I'm saying is that there is, there is uh, I'll, I'll just pick up this disease as an example. Uh, the people who had severe obsessive compulsive disorder, 
um, uh, there was a study by Jeffrey Schwartz and colleagues at the University of California that when they use CBT uh, to quieten their activity, uh, circuits they underline the obsessive compulsive disorder, this was as powerful as drugs that we use. Okay, so that's all I want to say here. So there's a way to learn how to be okay rather than just relying on a pill and a drug and a co-payment that we all kind of seem to do. And these, these folks were very interested in looking at the orbital front cortex in the OCD uh, you know, circuits of how these things work out. Uh, and then they found that, you know, uh, basically speaking, you know, the, you know, the, the, the brain can be self-directed and the neuroplasticity mean that we can, by our lifestyle and learning, can change the brain's, brain's doing. And this is an example for a prostate health. Uh, the Dean Ornish shows the power of diet and the lifestyle changing to improve the cancer survival. I have a friend of mine, he's at Harvard at this time, and he actually spoke a few years ago in this conference. He developed prostate cancer. And I used to kind of sit down with him and, you know, you need to do a little bit of yoga, a little bit of this, and he said, no, oh, you're so weird, I can't stand you. You know, that kind of a conversation. I said, that's fine, we can be friends and agree to disagree. Um, um, uh, but the point is, now he is calling me, so, oh, did you hear about that diet that Dean Ornish came up about? I said, didn't you, we, you and I talk about that? You know, you know eat healthy, and maybe your prostate is going to be healthy too. And he is now literally using all these things that were not in his landscape. He's a very good friend of mine, I'm not saying, but he was not attentive to the science which is already there. And so the lifestyles can change things. Kim uh, uh, and associates, can you move in? Yes, you all can come in. Yes, you can come in. Um, so, so my point was that this conversation is not about mental health. This conversation is about our total health. And as uh, Mental Health America always says, you know, there's no health without mental health. You know? So you have to have mental health to have a good health. And um, uh, so diet and those kind of things uh, play a significant role. Uh, so our wonderful mind has perceptions, belief systems, emotions. We got to make the, all of those things healthy. Our perceptions, our belief systems, our emotions, and, our health, and, and have a healthy response. Because without them, we are not going to be very, very. Uh, otherwise, we'll keep on paying a healthcare system which is broke already. We don't have enough money to fix all the plumbing systems of our body, but we have the ability to change our belief systems, our emotions.